Lynn, the Vacation Bible School Director here at Shiloh, and I'm here to let you know how virtual Vacation Bible School at Shiloh is going to work. Before I explain that, I want to let you know that our theme is Rocky Railway. Jesus' power pulls us through. I don't know about you, but I've needed Jesus' power a lot lately. I've been praying and asking Jesus for help during this difficult time. Every night, we will have a different Bible point and verse to go along with the theme. I'm very excited that we're going to set up a mini train station in front of our church for you to come by each evening to pick up a packet and food for the kids. If you don't have time to complete that night's video, you can do it in, on another day or whenever that fits your schedule, because everything is going to be recorded. The first night's packet will include a book for the elementary school kids and a worksheet, and worksheet for the preschool. These will have our Bible stories each night that you can use to follow along with our videos. We also will be giving out Bible buddies out each night that, that go along with our points, our Bible points each evening. And we're going to include a carabiner so you can hook your Bible buddy on to hold it. Also, we're going to have a Watch for God wristband. And we'll be talking about this each night and looking for ways that God, we see God in our life. All the items you will need for crafts that night will, and all week will be included. A printout with a video link to our YouTube channel will be there. And we will also post the link on our Shiloh's Facebook page as well. Our video each night will have an opening with Cam and myself. An entry to, Bi to the Bible Buddy for that night. Music, story time, craft, and a short closing. And a ticket. Have your child bring this ticket back each night, and we will punch it just like you were on a real train. We can't touch the ticket, so your child will need to hold it out the window so we can keep contact to a minimum. All of our interiors will be wearing face masks, and we will be checking their temperatures each day. Our youth leader, Jamie, will be having a packet for the youth each night to pick up as well. On the other nights, the packets will have Bible Buddy and craft for that night. And we will have food and drink available each night for pickup. Please be sure to sign up by June 28th to give us time to get everything together. A link to our registration page is on our website, shilohlexington.org. If you cannot access this or have problems registering, you can call the church at 336 787 5566 and leave a message. We will get back in touch with you. We are all very excited to see familiar faces and new ones as well. Good morning and welcome to Shiloh United Methodist Church in Lexington, North Carolina. We're happy you can join us this morning.
team for getting us started in worship this morning. We have some announcements to make today. The first is today is the 28th of June and that's the deadline. Today is the deadline to register for our virtual vacation Bible school. If you haven't done so yet, please be sure and go out to our website, shilohlexington.org, and there you'll find links to get you to the registration page um, because we'll be uh, making plans for those who have already registered um, this week because a week from today Vacation Bible School will be starting from 5 until 7 each night we'll be um, handing out the packets in the front parking lot so and we want each child to be a part so be sure and register today if you haven't already I also am very excited to make a big announcement and that is that a week from today on July 5th, we're going to gather together in the sanctuary for worship. Uh, it will not be like it has been. Um, you'll be getting more information this week on uh, sort of what the expectations are uh, and what the requirements are and, um, and an invitation to, to join us there. But let me just stress that if you're not comfortable 
joining in a big group, or you have underlying health conditions, or you're feeling a little bit under the weather, it's just fine to stay home. Uh, the service will be recorded each week, and so you'll still be able to join Shiloh United Methodist Church uh, and your fellow members or friends uh, in worship. Uh, you can do that still through the video way. Well, again, it's great to have you with us in worship today. Um, before we go any further, let's begin, or uh, continue, I should say, with a prayer. Holy God, to whom we bear our souls, we take comfort and courage in your presence. Through your love and light, we are able to, to explore what it takes to place our trust entirely in you. Help us lovingly put you before all else as we journey the roads of uncertainty, knowing that your faithful love shepherds us on paths unknown. Amen. The scripture passage for today comes from uh, the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. We're actually going to pick up where we left off last week. I'm going to begin at verse 40. Listen for God's special word for you today. Those who receive you are also receiving me. And those who receive me are receiving the one who sent me. Those who receive a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Those who receive a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. I assure you that everybody who gives even a cup of cold water to these little ones, because they are my disciples, will certainly be rewarded. These are the words of God for all of God's people. Thanks be to God. Well, in June of 2005, U.S. Navy SEAL Marcus Luttrell and SEAL Team 10 were sent on a mission to kill or capture Ahmad Rashad, a high-ranking Taliban leader responsible for killings in eastern Afghanistan and in the Hindu Kush mountains. Local shepherds stumbled upon the SEAL team and ended up betraying them to local Taliban militia and a horrific gun battle ensued. Marcus was the only SEAL survivor. Gravely wounded, he crawled and walked seven miles to avoid being captured. He was miraculously given shelter by an Afghan tribe who, at the risk of their very lives, alerted American forces to his presence. And the Americans then finally rescued Marcus after six days following the gun battle. The Afghan man who gave him shelter, gave Marcus the shelter, is Mohammed Ghalab. Muhammad lives by the Pashtunwali Code, a code of honor that promotes self-respect, independence, justice, hospitality, love, forgiveness, and tolerance toward all, especially to strangers and guests. Part of that Pashtunwali Code is a concept called Nanatawai, which means forgiveness or asylum. Nanatawai allows a person to seek refuge in the house of another, seeking asylum from his enemies. The guest, the host, excuse me, is honor bound to offer that protection, even at the cost of his own family or fortune. When Marcus found himself in enemy territory and saved by the Pashtunwali honor code, Mohammed prepared a table. It was a shelter for Marcus that literally saved his life. Mohammed was not, was not only threatened by the local Taliban's for sheltering Marcus in his home, but that persecution continued long afterward, even after Marcus had been um, rescued. The Taliban, in fact, targeted the entire village, considering them all traitors. Marcus and Mohammed have become good friends 
and Mohammed has since immigrated to the United States with his family, primarily because of the persecution that was so strong from the Taliban. It was a consequence of his providing shelter to a complete and total stranger who found himself in enemy territory. In the final three verses of Matthew chapter 10, we hear Jesus about, from Jesus about a reward for those who receive anyone representing him or his emissaries on God's global mission. The theology of mission that underlines the Gospel of Matthew is based on the principle of imitatio Christi, or imitating Christ. But it's far more than just imitation. In the Hebrew tradition, it's the word shalahim, and in Greek, it's apostolos, meaning the one who is sent represents the full presence of the one doing the sending. Matthew chapter 10 is known by scholars as the missionary discourse in which Jesus sends the 12 disciples to represent his presence entirely, just as he was sent by God the Father. If this sending passage seems unfamiliar or demanding to us, then perhaps it is time to re-examine what we understand of Christian living, what, what we know to be our calling as Jesus' disciples in the world. It is a call to witness that warns of persecution, poverty, and possibly even martyrdom. Matthew chapter 10 is the, is the essence of the Christian life. And according to M. Eugene Boring, when in his commentary on Matthew chapter 10, it is, and I quote him, confession of God's act in Jesus, living toward the end times with a concern for mission in this world, letting go of both material possessions and fear of what others might think about us or even do to us. It is placing our loyalty to the God revealed in Christ above all other loyalties, even the deepest ones of family and home, and to trust in God and God's future. For Matthew, this was not a call to the 12 disciples alone. This was a call to all the disciples of Jesus, a call to the deep, faithful representation of God and God's heart in the hospitality found in Jesus. And then we come to these three final verses, verses that we overhear as readers, as exhortation and promise directly from Jesus to those who would welcome his representatives, his missionaries. So what does it mean if we welcome Jesus' ambassadors we will share in their reward? And what kind of reward is that? It doesn't seem like the requirement has saintly stakes. A simple act of a hospitable welcome, a cup of cool water, we read, can mean full inclusion in Jesus' reward. At the very heart of God's mission is this startling reality. Welcoming the other, the stranger, the foreigner, the outsider, even the bedraggled traveling missionary is enough in God's eyes to be rewarded. The reward is centered in the deep hospitality that God has already shown us. We were first welcomed and offering welcome to others is the reward of being found in that sacred loop of God's very own heart, a heart of hospitality, a heart of welcome. Acts of hospitality are always possible. Cups of cool water, shared meals, clothing, shelter, even a listening ear, when we offer hospitality, we welcome the unknown. We invite the new, the, the different, 
the possibilities of a fresh perspective and, and vulnerable sharing. Matthew chapter 10 is Jesus' high calling and sending of the 12 disciples and by extension, all willing followers into God's mission. It is demanding. It is potentially dangerous. And it is stark. What if Christians took to heart this call to discipleship and the reward for hospitality as serious as Mohammed Galoob did when he welcomed Marcus Luttrell into his home? What if we bound our side, ourselves to God's hospitality like Mohammed did to his understanding of the Pashtunwali code, especially in the case of strangers and guests? What if, like Muhammad, we even prepared to offer Nantawa, Nantawai, excuse me, or sanctuary to those not just who are Jesus' emissaries, but even to our enemies, or to those who simply look different than we do, perhaps those whose skin tones are much darker. Friends, I believe that we've been afforded a great opportunity to bring God's kingdom upon this earth. I grew up in the 60s, and I remember watching the civil rights marches on the television news, and I clearly remember the deaths of John F. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. I thought I was too young to march during the 60s. And I tried to convince myself that I'm too old to march today. But the truth is, I am not. None of us are. We have an opportunity to bring real, lasting change to our nation and to our world. And I plan to do everything I can in my corner of that world. And I hope and I pray that you will Two. Now, friends, we cannot do everything that needs to be done, but we can do something. Will the world know that we are Christians by our love and hospitality or by our short sighted and selfish boundaries? What does the welcome mat in front of our church or in front of your home represent? Does it reflect to the world that you're an ambassador of the full presence of God that's been shown to us in Jesus? Or does it subliminally indicate stranger danger to the outsider who's unfamiliar with the Jesus that you claim to worship? Do outsiders shake the dust off of their shoes when they leave our place of worship or, or your residence? Friends, let us welcome Jesus and the one who sent him by opening our lives in generosity and hospitality to all who cross our paths, whether friend or foe. By our hospitality, they will know we are Christians. And by our acts of hospitality, we will be included in the great reward of God's own welcome of us, who were once, but are no longer, strangers to love. Let us pray. What does taking up our crosses look like in this world? How does loving God more than our friends and family work? Let us find ways to authentically find our lives, risking all we have, learning how to love radically, and walking in the steps of Jesus. As we pour out our self-interests, let us drink the faithful love of God. Let us take in salvation and abiding grace. Amen. Friends, we're going to spend a few moments now 
with God once again in prayer as we lift up our joys and our concerns. And I know you have your own joys and concerns, and so I'm going to encourage you to lift those up as well as we go to God in this time of prayer. Today we're particularly thankful, I'm particularly thankful, for all of the technology that has allowed us to worship, even in this time of, um, of separation and social distancing. I'm extremely thankful to our videographers who have been able to put these worship services together, and especially in such a, a fine and professional way. I probably shouldn't share this all with you, but I have to tell you that a few weeks ago, uh, I invited my brother and sister-in-law to worship with us uh, on the computer over the internet. And they started our worship service, and after a few moments, they shut it off and called to make sure that I'd given them the right address because they couldn't believe that was Shiloh United Methodist Church's worship service. Just thought I'd share that. I, we're also thankful today that God has given us a call to hospitality and love for all people. Today we lift up in our prayers um, Virginia Wiesner and the test results that she'll be getting from her sonogram. Uh, we lift up Bill Adams, who's still waiting for that test. And we lift up our son and daughter-in-law, Cheryl's and mine, Scott and Brenda Kelly, out in Texas as they await COVID test results. We pray for Dennis Wilt. We pray for all of our homebound members and, and all who reside in nursing facilities. We pray for Mary Barrier and all of her family on the death of her sister, Joanne, and for all who grieve this day. We pray for our president, for our governor, and for all who work in government. Every governmental job is a challenge in these times. We pray for our soldiers. We pray for all those who have COVID-19 and all those who seek to heal those who have COVID-19. We pray for racial justice. And we pray, we pray that we would be known as Christians. Friends, let us now go to God in prayer. Spirit of God, we have heard your call to share in the building up of your kingdom. Fill us with a desire to change ourselves and change our world. Inflame our passion for justice into a commitment to address unjust situations and structures. Deepen our concern for our sisters and brothers here in America and overseas who endure the burdens of poverty, war, persecution, and injustice. Let us enthusiastically play our part in the mission of the church in our world. Banish any complacency in our hearts and minds. Teach us to recognize the lack of justice, and may we always act in the spirit of justice. May we envision, pray about, and create a different sort of world in which injustice is replaced with a renewed sense of solidarity and care. And now, enlivened by the Holy Spirit, May we go forth in the peace of that same spirit to love and serve you. Amen.
speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So, no matter what I say, what I believe, or what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. So let my life be the proof, the proof of your love. Let my love look like you in what you're made of. How you live, how you die, love is sacrifice. So let my life be the proof, the proof of your love.